A great shadow has come, and it threatens now to cast its darkness over all of Middle-earth. You might find yourself surprised that The Lord of the Rings is a story of decline. In the first book of the trilogy, Galadriel speaks of her time in Middle-earth, dwelling there for years uncounted with the Lord of the Galadrim, as together they fought what she calls a long defeat. It's a stark contrast from what readers have come to believe is the actual message of the books, that the smallest of goods might still triumph over evil. Tolkien wrote a number of letters throughout his life that helped to lay out his thought process regarding the Rings and Hobbit novels, along with the mythologies he wrote in the form of the Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales, and in letter 195, he mentions this drawn-out decline specifically. Actually, I am a Christian, and indeed a Roman Catholic, so that I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat. Tolkien's perception of history as a long and wary reduction in the quality of things seems fundamental to the philosophy behind his stories, and for his Christian theology, with man having fallen from some earlier state of being. Moreover, if the decades following his death have taught us anything, it's that Tolkien was right about certain aspects of our society, in particular how we treat beloved stories in their later adaptations. But let's return to the books for just a moment, because before we start our conversation, I want to run a thought by you. It's a thought that's central to the topic of this video essay, that Tolkien's idea of decline doesn't just restrict itself to his good characters. In fact, we also see it in his villains. Morgoth, the greatest evil, is defeated by the angelic Valar, only for a lesser version of him, Sauron, to take his place. And when Sauron is defeated, the ending to The Lord of the Rings shows the lesser Saruman taking his place. The physical deaths of the latter two are also similar. While the destruction of the One Ring reduces Sauron to a shadowy spirit, crowned by lightning, terrible but impotent, and ultimately blown away by a great wind after his death, Saruman also becomes spirit-like when he's stabbed to death in the Shire, with his smaller, misty ghost also being blown away in a similar fashion. In other words, lesser characters inherit greater histories. Keep that in mind as we have our conversation here, because it's with this sort of theme that Tolkien, maybe more than any other writer of his time, predicted what would ultimately become of his works and of the people who tried to adapt them. Amazon Incorporated is a publicly traded American multinational business focusing on e-commerce and information technology. Its stock belongs to the bank bundle, along with the likes of Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and Google, all of which are collectively valued at over three trillion dollars. In recent years, the mega corporation has started to break into streaming, producing hit shows like The Boys, Invincible, Good Omens, and The Man in the High Castle. Though ironically, Amazon as a company actually started out by delivering books. When Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder, created the company in 1995, the internet was just starting to blossom. And so while taking orders online, he was also out delivering books in his own car. Package for the gentleman. Over time, he scaled up his operations and branched away from books, but at the end of the day, and certainly at first glance, it seems like there should be no better company to come full circle and oversee production of a prequel series to some of fantasy's greatest novels. I mean, surely Jeff Bezos, and by extension his company, Amazon, understands the gravity of adapting the books and living up to the greatness of their companion movies, Peter Jackson's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Yet here we stand. And yet here I stand. With fans of Tolkien on one side and Amazon, its Rings of Power series, and a juggernaut of paid promoters on the other. Despite this, it's too easy to paint the company like a villain. And while they've been accused of being disloyal to the source material, putting on disingenuous PR stunts, and even hiring journalists to write hit pieces against their critics, I think that it's more important for both fans and Amazon to look back on how characteristics of the company's approach to adapting Tolkien, along with their approach to communicating with fans, actually shares elements of the characters who either knowingly or unknowingly could commit acts of evil in Tolkien's books. So that's it. That's what this video essay is about. Is Amazon an evil company? Well, no. And even for those drawing connections between Amazon and Tolkien's quote-unquote evil characters, remember that all of Middle-earth's major villains started out with some good qualities. So in the spirit of hosting an honest analysis, I'm not going to reduce things to that, and you'll even be able to find a short section later where I talk about the company's perspective. Because a larger organization like that isn't an individual. It's a collection of stakeholders, policies, and employees. And it's important to know the nuts and bolts of why they make the decisions they do. That said, there are problems. And knowing how to fix them will benefit both the fans and Amazon itself. But did Tolkien actually realize that one day a company would come across his works, desiring to use them for their own ends, but in their quest find only corruption instead? To figure that out, we'll need to go back 
59 years into the past. It's a chilly afternoon in October, and Tolkien pens a letter to Miss Eileen Elgar in which he discusses a hypothetical. What if Gandalf used the One Ring? Letter 246. A Gandalf as Ring Lord would have been far worse than Sauron. He would have remained righteous, but self-righteous. Thus, while Sauron multiplied evil, he left good clearly distinguishable from it. Gandalf would have made good detestable and seem evil. And while he would destroy Sauron, if Gandalf proved the victor, the ring and all its works would have endured. It would have been master in the end. So while Gandalf would still attempt to rule for the benefit of his subjects, his goodness and wisdom would eventually become detestable to the people because of how they were applied. It's an interesting and similar concept to how groups like governments or companies in the real world adopt well-meaning policies, only to misapply those policies, thereby resulting in pushback from the general public. Perhaps one of the most talked about policy backfires that fits this definition is ESG. Have you used MSG in your life? If you get bad grade, sprinkle MSG on your exam, it will be A++++. No, 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 no. <laughs> ESG. ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, three categories that modern Western companies attempt to blend into their overall business objectives. The idea is that, at its core, a company has just one goal, to make money. Money! But this goal often creates problems for the communities and consumers around that company. For example, a miner extracting nickel might pump water out from a cavern to get at the ores, but while drilling, they leave behind tailings, or scrap ore, that isn't used. Now when they leave, the tunnel then refloods, and the water interacts with those tailings, creating acid drainage that leaks out and harms nearby wildlife. Sure, the company's made its profit, but at what cost to those around it, and at what cost to the company's own future? Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do. ESG attempts to solve that problem by tying environmental, social, and governance responsibilities into the core goal of the company, making money. In other words, it forces companies to realize that ESG's three categories all have an impact on their profit. To hit home the point, firms like Morgan Stanley use grades to measure how well a company is integrating these goals. Triple C for B's for basic and A's for teacher's pet. And here's a sweetener. Companies with higher scores get access to better capital funding and investment opportunities. After all, if ESG forces a miner to remove its tailings instead of leaving them in a cave, thereby preventing acid leaks, thereby preventing lawsuits, Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. then that company as a result is now a less risky investment than it was before. And investors love de-risking. The problem is companies being companies usually look for the quickest and most obvious ways to shoehorn ESG into their business models. And then they PR the hell out of it. And that creates a whole different kind of risk. The risk that, much like a corrupted Gandalf, their look how great I am top-down approach to creating a more socially responsible environment will nearly always be met with backlash, especially when it does so on the back of a beloved and already established work of fiction. The application of ESG by large megacorporations makes good detestable. You can see it in nearly every reaction video to the Rings of Power, along with every comment section on YouTube the second you sort comments by newest. Moreover, if Amazon is using its Rings of Power TV adaptation as a stepping stone for meeting and boasting about its ESG compliance, then elements of its own inclusion policy start to undermine any claims by the showrunners that they hired their actors solely based on how well they fit the roles, and it makes audiences wonder from the get-go if roles were created specifically to comply with these policies. Because even if the policy's minimum percentages aren't mandatory, no plot for a flagship Amazon TV series would ever be greenlit if it couldn't fit those guidelines and demonstrate ESG compliance. And that's a shame, because this kind of racial and gender classification ends up turning stories into checklists, and it robs creators and actors from all communities of the kind of organic story growth that can make their work genuinely special. But let's reel it back to lit analysis here, because there's a second theme going on, a yin-yang of control and entrapment. Every villain in Tolkien's books desired some form of control, and often it was tied to a physical object. In The Hobbit, Smaug desired control over the Lonely Mountain's vast treasure. In Lord of the Rings, Sauron desired control over Middle-earth, while Saruman desired control over the One Ring in order to control Sauron. Even Morgoth, the ultimate evil, desired control over the physical world, Arda, so much so that he forced his spirit into it. But ironically, it's this same desire for control that ends up trapping all of Tolkien's villains. Smog remained within the mountain for 171 years, paranoidly guarding his treasure from the dwarves. Sauron diminishes into a powerless spirit when his own ring tempts Gollum into stealing it, and the creature falls into the fires of Mount Doom. 
and Morgoth, by injecting his spirit into the physical world of Arda, ironically fulfills Ilavatar's condition that any Valar who enters into the world would be contained within it until its end. Out of each form of control, every Tolkien villain fashions his own prison. And then there's Amazon. After a series of tedious negotiations, the company was able to purchase the rights to some, but not all, of Tolkien's content. With these rights costing a sum of 250 million, it also committed an additional 58 million to filming costs per episode, making The Rings of Power the most expensive TV show in history. But that left Amazon in a strange place. While they have the rights to Peter Jackson's films and Tolkien's appendices, they lack access to the Silmarillion and any First Age material, meaning that even while trying to create a story that falls between the First Age and the Third, they have to deal with a minefield of lore that they legally can and cannot use. This was alluded to in the interview between Tom Shippey, a Tolkien scholar, and the German news outlet, Deutsche Tolkien Gesellschaft. Again, they have a certain form of control, but also a very restrictive one with the Tolkien estate being able to veto any creative choices they make in their adaptation. But being a resourceful company, Amazon does have other means of control that they can rely on. Even if they make a rudimentary story, storytelling is only half the battle. And knowing is half the battle. In the real world where there needs to be return on investment, public relations, or PR, fills the gaps. And controlling the narrative of conversations about your story can often be just as important as controlling its rights. It's a very Sodominian pursuit, and it's one that Tolkien was well aware of. In Letter 181, he discusses this kind of approach to the character, Sodomon. In particular, he emphasizes how Sodomon's impatience at the task set before him to protect Middle-earth from Morgoth led the wizard down a path of realizing that control and domination could lead to quicker outcomes than standing back as a steward and advisor while letting the world take its natural course. In that way, Sodomon is the antithesis to Gandalf, and it's why the powers that be chose Gandalf as their champion over Saruman. Yet this doesn't leave the White Wizard powerless, as throughout his betrayal, he exerts another form of control, that of his voice. And believe me when I say that Saruman of many colors, many colors. is a one-man PR department. Suddenly another voice spoke, low and melodious, its very sound and enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words that they had heard, and if they did, they wondered, for little power remained in them. Mostly, they remembered only that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking, and that all it said seemed wise and reasonable, and desire awoke in them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast, and if they gainsaid the voice, Anger was kindled in the hearts of those under the spell. When Saruman, trapped atop Orthanc, attempts to convince the Fellowship to let him go, Gimli replies, On the language of Orthanc, help means ruin, and saving means slaying. That is plain. And so it is for Amazon. The dynamic and quickly changing markets of the world mean that to be patient and wait for organic growth of new stories is, well, basically a death sentence. To that extent, the company can't be blamed. Neither can they be blamed for simply buying the rights to a pre-established franchise, which comes with a pre-packaged audience. But what they can be blamed with is misunderstanding that audience, and thinking that they could merge their corporate ESG goals into the story, then signal boost support for those goals through interviews, articles, and repeated talking points, to create enough of an illusion of support that the fans would have to either come around to their adaptation or be villainized by the people who did. Let's tackle the specifics of those two things in order. While Amazon applies the environmental and governance sections of ESG to its net-zero supply chain attempts and customer service businesses respectively, social falls squarely into its media domain. I want you to try something here. Watch the following clips and then tell me what you learned and didn't learn. The thing I, that I think is really exciting and refreshing and long overdue is that this is a show that seemingly reflects much more of our world today. There will no longer be, longer be a time where you can say there are no elves of color. Uh, I find myself in New Zealand uh, playing the first female dwarf and... Can you give me any kind of teases of what we can expect from an actual thriving version of this area? So we erased that one. You know? Yeah, I think it is time. I think um, with a franchise of this scale, it is so important that we make it as accessible as we possibly can. I, I mean, the, the designers have made such an incredible job of building Casa Doom. A lot of what you see on TV will be what we saw on the day as well. Um, like actual running water running down a wall, a live 
Uh, this conversation will never be there. Oh, you're... No. I'm an elf. The next person that comes after me won't have to talk about this. So we're definitely... That's what it means to me. But we also get to open the door and flood a new fan base in. Live plantation and fire, open flames, kind of lighting. Um. In. Uh, there are so many... Um, diverse people out there who will have really enjoyed all of the works that we've seen before but now they get to see themselves staring back at them like here's what i learned there's a consistent theme of diversity and the need to represent marginalized communities very esg and very inclusion policy compliant 10 out of 10 triple a morgan stanley would do backflips off their private yachts here's what i didn't learn actual details about the plot of the story which is weird. Despite being filmed just a couple months before the release of The Rings of Power, so little has been said through the actor interviews, the trailers, the overall promotion, that the only thing left for audiences to think of when they think of The Rings of Power is the diversity and the need to represent marginalized communities. And for longtime fans who wanted nothing more than to see Amazon's adaptation remain true to Tolkien's work, every time a bait and switch like this happens, it only inflames them more. What's worse is because of this vagueness and redirection, we also see less of the work that actually goes into the production. And there is a great deal of work, from the filming crew to prop design to the actors, dialect coaches, directors, to put together a production like this takes many moving parts. But none of that is seen, and instead there's just the message. And ironically, it's that message that undermines the greater whole. Okay, so Saruman has his weapon words. The next question is, how does he amplify them? In Tolkien's Two Towers, Saruman sat concealed in the impenetrable Isengard, funnily enough, hoarding treasures in the same way that Amazon hoards plot details. And while he was there, he used his intermediaries to spread his word. In Amazon's case, there are two main examples of intermediaries gone wrong. First, the superfans, and second, the journalists. Okay, superfans are an obvious mess. The goal is to show that some of the most involved fans of Lord of the Rings are excited to see Amazon's adaptation. Speak to the young people in their language. Okay, good strategy, but execution-wise? Wait, did they just forget the other girl? Ugh, it speaks for itself. Amazon probably also had to ensure that these individuals were well vetted and would only offer strictly positive, and again, vague, feedback on what they were shown. And that's not my extrapolation, that's a fact. Companies use a document called a creative brief to set out standards for how they expect influencers to behave, what topics they want them to cover, and even the overall tone they want them to have. And the easiest way to ensure that someone adheres to a creative brief is by using someone who's essentially a blank slate. Going back to the Superfans interview, you can see that pretty plainly. Chanel Williams is a Harry Potter skit TikToker, Joel Rochester is a general booktuber, and Kelsey Ellison is an actress and prosthetics YouTuber. From what I can tell, none of these three superfans have anything to do with Tolkien's work. And as a result, you get this. Like Sauron is hot, I feel like people will be like, I can fix him. <laughs> and the direct approach of fan-to-fan -fan engagement falls flat on its face. In Letter 207, Tolkien tears right into this kind of superficial partner program. And this one's less about his characters and more about a filmmaker who is trying to adapt The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> no, not that one. He's precious. In 1958, Morton Zimmerman, a screenwriter, was fingered by an American agent working with Tolkien to film an animated adaptation to the writer's books. In it, he'd made Lothlorien into a magic floating castle, Radagast into an eagle, Boromir's name was misspelt as Bodimor, multiple times, and the elves were tiny floating creatures with wings. It was enough to thoroughly disgust Tolkien, who basically wrote back, politely, that Zimmerman was incapable of reading books. To be fair, the showrunners also demonstrate some Zimmerman-like qualities, and it crops up during interviews where they'll mention something that comes back to bite them, like how Nori Brandyfoot, the hobbit-like Harfoot, has an adventurous Baggins-like characteristic, without realizing that adventure actually comes from their Tukish heritage, as one comment points out here. Alternatively, Amazon had and still has the option to do something more productive, like have the actual showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay do an AMA on Reddit or something. It would be more direct, open, and honest with fans, and it could still be done in an environment where their replies were vetted to reduce spoilers before they were posted. And there's an appetite for it. You can see it right here. There are fans who want to engage with the actual people involved in the show, not be preached down at by arm's length hirelings. In fact, it baffles me why they didn't try this earlier. And Amazon, if you're listening, it can't possibly get you any worse publicity than the approach you've already taken. Alright, so Amazon's version of direct-to-fan doesn't work. 
here's their plan B. When in doubt, media it out. With a superfan approach flopping, Amazon is more generally forced to rely on something with a little more finesse. And I use that word very, very lightly. Professional interneters, opinion connoisseurs, self-proclaimed people who know stuff. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. I'm talking about true Leonardo DiCaprio's of the Renaissance. Journalists. On February 13th, Amazon released its first teaser trailer for The Rings of Power. Critical reception was not hot. And to date, the trailer stands at 129,000 likes to 1.8 million dislikes. I'm doing my part! Which you can see with the return to YouTube dislike extension. Now, around this time, as well as directly before it, there were several articles from media outlets characterizing fans as disliking the rings of power for its inclusion of minority characters. Let's see how they did this, specifically by tossing one of those articles onto the autopsy table and dissecting it a bit. Lord of the Rings, Racist Reaction to Amazon Prime Series, written on February 16th by Jessica Hubbard. One of the first things you'll notice is that this article features a picture of a tweet, and not the racism in question, but rather a reaction to the racism. The reaction comes courtesy of Sean Gunner, a UK communication strategist and chair of the Token Society. Yeah, that one. On Twitter, Gunner, who only allows those he follows or mentions to reply to his tweets, laments the widespread racism from fans who are unable to accept people of color playing Tolkien's characters. While the Argus's article tightly controls the narrative by showing a quote that reacts to the racism without showing the racism, the quote itself is tightly controlled, only allowing comments that agree with, affirm, and support its message. And that seems to be a theme here, as the article then goes on to talk about more tweets that reacted to the racism. And then it ends. There's no context, no analysis, just, again, the message. And of course, this time, the enemy. And looking at other articles, they all followed this format of a carefully constructed narrative centered around a reaction to a straw man that the reader never gets to see. Remember that for Tolkien, Sodominian behavior was something that used language to paint opposing viewpoints as wrong, stupid, and evil, whereas people were coaxed into agreeing with Saruman's viewpoints out of the desire to seem good and reasonable themselves. There's no better real-world example of this than the news outlets who preemptively call fans with valid criticism of the show racists, and while my channel isn't a political one, it's the unfortunate reality that politics, much like raw sewage, leaks into almost every other subject. At this point, you know, I flipped through several of these articles and I'm getting fed up about not being able to find any of the actual racism they're commenting on. So what I've done is I've taken a couple major websites, Twitter and Reddit, and I've run my own informal experiment. Using the search functions, I've typed in some not-so-nice words and gone looking for racist comments, all the way back to February, when the show's trailer aired. And you know what? I found some. 38. In total. Now, assuming both sites have heavy moderation, which I'm sure they do, let's say that they've been able to catch and delete, I don't know, 99% of all offensive commentaries? Okay, that would take us up to 3,800 comments in total. Let's add YouTube to that, and because it's harder to measure, assume it had something big, like, oh, I don't know, 10,000 racist comments? Okay, that brings us up to 13,800. Add Facebook and uh, assume another 10,000. Add Instagram and TikTok and uh, Snapchat? Another 30,000 comments. And a total of 53,800 racist comments. Boom! Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick mess. The Amazon trailer was seen 30 million times, which means 30 million people had an opportunity to post something racist. Compared to those who did, that gives us a grand total of 0.179% of possible comments. We can even be very liberal with our numbers and assume that it was something closer to 5% of all possible comments. Well, those of you who know me as a writer know that I value both freedom of thought and freedom of exchange in as grown-up a manner as possible. And frankly, Amazon, and more broadly the stakeholders of legacy media as a whole, need to really start reflecting on why there's a growing popularity amongst alternative news sources, who often either take views contrary to signal-boosted mainstream ones, or decide to leave politics out of their commentaries altogether. Look, I don't buy the argument that a boogeyman fandom is sabotaging a creative project run by a trillion dollar corporation enterprise, or that society as a whole is an us versus them setup. Society is an ecosystem. And over the past four years, that ecosystem has been adjusting to biased news by seeking out alternative sources, including on YouTube, where alt media has grown exponentially, with pop culture critics like Nerdrotic, The Critical Drinker, Clownfish TV, Just Some Guy, It's a Gundam, Disparu, RK Outpost, and social commentators like The Quartering, uh, Timcast, and John Talks, all seeing massive increases in their audience sizes. 
It comes on the back of eroding trust in the institutions that are supposed to offer honest views, not help to meet ESG goals or tantalize or patronize their audiences, and not use straw man arguments to other critics of projects like the Rings of Power. To cap things off, look, Amazon's not an evil company. It's a company. It supports STEM fields through its Amazon Engineer program, it's invested over $530 billion in US infrastructure and $1.2 billion to provide free education and skills training for its workers. Last year it funded 568 affordable homes in Seattle through its Housing Equity Fund, with a total of $1.2 billion allocated for creating and preserving over 8,000 affordable homes for low-income families. Its AWS web service is used broadly across America for internet infrastructure. Uh, it supports the arts through its Artisan Residence program, and it employs over 1.3 million people worldwide. In 2018, it was one of the first major companies to increase its starting wage to $15 an hour. And if you go on Reddit or any other website, most people even say it's an alright place to work at. On top of that, you have showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay who, despite having few genuine productions under their belt, did do Jungle Cruise and, uh, I had fun with that movie. But seriously, Amazon does seem to have made some effort to bolster its showrunners with reasonably strong episode directors like Juan Antonio Bayona, who did a Monster Calls and The Impossible. McKay and Payne also mentioned that they structured their story around the token materials they had, and introduced non-token characters only into places where they felt there were gaps in the lore. If we take that at face value, then it suggests that the creation and addition of the Rings of Power's characters like the Harfoots and Arendir do serve some narrative purpose. And for Amazon, I'd assume that's important, as its stated goal has been that for the show to be profitable, it must reach as wide an audience as possible. Logically, though it would only be probable, with a coherent story pitch from Payne and McKay. All in all, there's a lot of pressure from both fans and investors to make the Rings of Power into as wide a success as possible. And so, for what it's worth, I'm willing to assume there are good faith efforts being made to achieve this on Amazon's part. But. Amazon's poor handling of the Rings of Power up to now can still categorically be summed up by Tolkien's letters, which predicted the mess that would come from the kind of approach it's taken. In Letter 195, we see a decline between what was and what Amazon seeks to recreate. In Letter 246, we're shown how, by trying to spread qualities like diversity and representation with a top-down approach, Amazon ends up creating much of its own backlash. Letter 181 tells us that the company's approaches in trying to manipulate the narrative don't work even if from a corporate standpoint they're considered the best go-to tactics. And Letter 207 tells us that superficial, arm's-length handling of a book's adaptation is doomed to fail. And with Amazon having only managed to acquire certain parts of Tolkien's works, it's basically guaranteed that they would have to be arm's-length and superficial with respect to the greater context of Middle-earth. But, part two. At the end of the day, Amazon is a big company, made up of lots of different people in a sink or swim position regarding the rings of power. Its showrunners are under a lot of stress to live up to two conflicting goals of ESG and traditional token. Its actors have had to deal with delays from COVID and production issues, while being able to share very little about their actual characters with the world, and any attempt to market Amazon's story has been met with nearly global backlash, though there are online communities who want to see the show succeed. In that sense, Amazon is a lot like its fans, who are under the stress of seeing their childhood stories being taken on and managed as a product for sale by a monolithic corporation. Fans who've had to deal with a tight-lipped and secretive enterprise holding the fate of the stories they love hostage. Fans who have seen that any attempt they make to raise their concerns has been met with accusations and gaslighting. If Tolkien were alive today, I'm sure he'd have a lot to say about the state of the world and about how divided we've all become. But in his absence, it's our responsibility mine and yours, to speak up and, to what extent we can, try to see things from both sides, for the benefit and the inclusion of everyone. Here's one final letter. It's letter 131, and in it, Tolkien talks about the second age in which Amazon's Rings of Power is set. There he describes how in the age's twilight the elves were fading, and as a consequence were still obsessed with the idea of having lost their once great kingdoms. They became sad, and their art antiquarian and their efforts all really a kind of embalming, even though they also retain the old motive of their kind, the adornment of the earth, and the healing of its hurts. He also says that it was only when a friendship arose between the dwarves and the elves of that time that the crafts of the two reached their highest development. It's therefore perhaps a mistake to linger too long on old stories, though we may love them greatly, and as much of a mistake to champion new ones without the cooperation of old friends. In that sense, I think there's a lot we could all learn from each other, 
and so many ways we could improve on the art of storytelling as it stands today. If only there was less of an effort to impose, and more of one to understand. Yours truly. If you enjoyed this video, consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. It's what the elves would have wanted.